season of hip replacements to have two testimonies like that in, in one night it's quite amazing there must be a message there somewhere i'm not sure what it is but <laughs> anyway happy new year to everybody um we'll try and talk a little bit slow here because there's a bit of an echo in the office at Karakalinga. but happy new year we hope that you have a, a great year of revival we, we love the work in fresno and um, we love talking to pastor david and sister alice and and David and Mary and all the other ones that have fellowship we've known over the years. It's a great time. Um, so I wanted to talk about salvation today. So we're going to go to John in chapter 1, verse 41. John chapter 1, verse 41. I'll check the time. John chapter 1, verse 41. Salvation or the Messiah. And it says here in verse 41, Andrew, this is, he findeth his own brother Simon and saith unto him, we have found the Messiah, which is being interpreted the Christ. He brought him to Jesus, and when Jesus held, beheld him, he said, Thou art Simon, the son of Jonah, thou shalt be called Zephyrus, which is by interpretation a stone. So straight away, there's this message there that the Messiah is the Christ. And if we go to John chapter 4, there's two witnesses here that say the same thing, two different people. John in chapter 4, verse 25, verse 24 will go, God is a spirit, Jesus said, and they that worship him must worship him in truth and in spirit. Verse other way around. The woman saith unto him, I know that the Messiah, which is called Christ, when he is come, he will tell us all things. Jesus said unto her, and you can't get a more clearer definition of who was the Messiah. Jesus said unto her, I that speak unto thee am he. So Jesus himself said he was the Christ, the Messiah, the Saviour of the Lord, the Anointed One. Um, I mentioned a few months ago, but I'll just say it again, that April the 18th of 1981 was the year that I received the Holy Spirit and I was baptised. It's coming up to 40 years this year. Before that, um, I was able to swear and blaspheme at home. And from a very young age, I was a, a tragically a prolific blasphemer of uh, the name Jesus Christ. And I would put my fist up to the heavens and scream at God and abuse him and call him all sorts of names under the, you name it. I'll, I'm not exaggerating, but I, I know. And if I banged my hand, it was just a cuss and a curse to God. And from April the 18th in 1981, one of the great miracles that Pastor David was mentioning about miracles and the gifts that we have and, and getting used to being uh, seeing the miracles of God. And it just was a very profound comment because we, we see miracles every day, don't we, even today with the spiritual gifts. Um, but the great thing for my life, one of the great miracles on April the 18th in 1981 was the last time that I ever blasphemed the name of Jesus Christ. And when I received the Spirit that day, I spoke in tongues to this day, early January of 21, uh, there's been no blasphemy. And I could not have done that. As Pastor David said before, we, in these things we do, we can't do it on our own strength. We know they come from God. It's impossible not to swear or blaspheme except we have the Holy Ghost. And people don't even know they're doing it half the time. It just becomes part of their speech. And when we do correct them, hey, stop swearing, they go, what? what are you talking about? They don't even know they're doing it. So that was a miracle for me. The Messiah, Jesus Christ, came into my life, into my heart, and I was anointed with the Holy Ghost and fire. And that salvation message we have today. Let's go to Luke in chapter 9. Luke 9. And we're just going to follow a little bit of Peter in, in light of talking about salvation, but we'll just sort of pick up a few things on Peter's life along the way and some of the disciples. So in Luke 9, he tells the 12 to go out and to preach the gospel. He gives them, in verse 1, he called the 12 disciples together. He gave them power and authority over all devils and to cure diseases. He sent them to preach the kingdom of God and to heal the sick. And he said unto them, Take nothing for your journeys, neither stave the script, neither bread, nor money, neither take two and neither have two coats of peace. And there's a bit more on that verse there. But they were told to go out and preach. They did. They had a, a wonderful time of what was happening in that 
part of the world then. And if we pick it up in verse 18, um, it came to pass that as he was alone, they came back, they're happy about what's been taking place. Uh, his disciples, with his disciples, the same ones, he asked them, saying, Who say the people that I am? They answering said, John the Baptist, the son of Elias. Others say that one of the old prophets is risen again. And verse 20, he said unto them, But whom say ye that I am? Peter answering, Great line here, the Christ of God, the Messiah of God. And he straightly charged them, commanded them to tell no man that thing, saying, The Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected of the elders, the chief priests, the scribe, and be slain and risen on the third day. Just a really powerful moment that Peter gets this great revelation. And it's not long after they've just performed these amazing miracles of raising people out of their difficult situations, of people being healed, of devils departing, and a great authority. They came back with this amazing story, the 12 disciples. If we go to chapter 10, he then gives um, 70. After these things, the Lord, verse 1, appointed other 70 also and sent them two by two before his face into every city and place whither he himself would come. And therefore he said unto them, The harvest truly is great, but the labourers are few. Pray ye therefore the Lord of the harvest that he will send forth his labourers into his harvest. And he said, Go into the king, go and preach the kingdom of God. That's what he, his message was there. And again for Tom, go to verse 17. The 70 return again, just like the 12, with joy saying, Lord, even the devils are subject unto us through thy name. And he said unto them, I beheld Satan as lightning falling from heaven. What an amazing thought that Jesus, the Messiah, the Christ, the Christ of God, as Peter referred him to, gave 12 people, 12 men authority to go and preach and to heal and to cast out devils. They did that. Peter gets this great revelation that he's the Christ of God. Another seven to go out. They're given power by Jesus Christ, the anointed one. He gave authority for these people to go out and they preached the gospel and they came back with great joy declaring that even the devils were subject to his name. And what does he say? That he beheld Satan falling as lightning from heaven. He saw his moment of the downfall of Satan as Jesus Christ came on this earth and started his ministry. Behold, verse 19, I give you unto you power to tread on the serpents and scorpions. I mean, imagine if that was you or I sitting there listening to these things for the first time ever, <laughs> ever. We're just sitting there and he tells us to go out wow, two by two, me and Christine and husbands and wives here, you know, Pastor David and Alice, right, you guys, out you go, we come back. And he says, I've given you power to tread on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy, and nothing shall by any means hurt you. Wow, what a, what a calling. But then he, he puts sort of icing on the cake. Notwithstanding in this rejoice not, but that the spirits are subject to your name, that they're subject to your name, but rather rejoice because your names are written in heaven. You're alive, you walk in this earth, you hear about Jesus Christ, you hear that maybe he's the Messiah, the word's got out, and you're one of the very few, and he grabs you, and then not only do we have power on that day, we come back just floating on heaven, if you like, because of what we've just seen. And we all know that, we have a uh, go, we have a good night, even even now, when we go into someone's home, we have prayer for them when they receive the Holy Spirit. What a great time we have driving home. In any, whether it's the middle of winter or middle of summer, we have a great moment when, when these things happen. So here's this in abundance, and then we've got Jesus Christ telling us face to face, your names are written in heaven. That's the power that the Messiah wanted to demonstrate there and then. Let's go to... Luke 22. Luke 22. 
a little bit further. And then along the line, Simon Peter's still doing good and wonderful things and not so good things, um, which we can happen. Now, I want to bear in mind that the 12 that were doing all these miracles and the other 70, we've got one name there, Judas Iscariot. We're talking about salvation, how that we must constantly work at our salvation. Judas Iscariot went bad, even though he had all these miracles that were performed. And we've got to make sure that we stay vigilant with our, our own salvation. And even Simon Peter, it says here in verse 31, the Lord said to Simon Peter, Behold, Satan, whom he held falling from the heavens, sort of thing, has desired to have you, that he may sift you as wheat. But Jesus said, But I have prayed for you, that thou, thy faith fail not. And when thou art converted, strengthen the brethren. So this is a real serious moment in Peter's life. And he said, Lord, I'm ready to go with thee both into prison and to death. And he said, Peter, I tell you, the cock shall not crow, the cock shall not crow this day before that thou shalt thrice deny that you know me. Three times you're going to deny me, Peter, before the night's out. And here he was um, saying he's ready to die for him. And, you know, the things that Peter had carried out as well, the miracles that we read in Luke chapter 9. Here's his defining moment that the Lord is trying to show these people that when you have the anointing, you can do great things. But take that anointing away at the time because Jesus had that anointing. He was imparting with authority, but it wasn't in them. And when salvation comes into us, the same principle applies. We've got to keep working on our salvation and not let it, do not take it for granted. And he said unto him, verse 35, he said unto them, When I sent you without purse of scribe and shoes, lack you anything? And he said, nothing. Peter said, nothing. Jesus said, and then he said unto them, But now he that had a purse, let him take it. And likewise a scribe, a script. And he said, And he that hath no sword, let him sell his garment and buy one. For I say unto you, that this is that which written must be yet accomplished in me. And he was reckoned among the transgressors. For these, for the things concerning me, have an end. Jesus was coming, the Messiah. He was going to live his life and demonstrate the kingdom of God with great power and authority, as he did, and he imparted that onto the people at the time. But that part was going to come to an end. Jesus' life as a physical man was coming to an end. And then they said unto him in verse thirty-eight, "Lord, behold, here are two swords." And he said unto them. It's enough. No more explaining. We've got to move on. Um, so we've got amazing power, amazing authority. And in these men's lives, they had limited understanding and strength because they hadn't yet been filled with the Holy Ghost. We're talking about the power of the Messiah changing the then known world. And he certainly changed the lives of people then. In verse 47. And while he yet spoke, Behold, a multitude, and he that was called Judas, one of the twelve, who went before them and drew near unto Jesus to kiss him. But Jesus said unto him, Judas, betrayest thou the Son of Man with a kiss? The man who had performed great miracles. We read there back in Luke 9. One of the twelve disciples, and then the other seventy, that no doubt they may have been part of, that number, or it might have been 82, or it might have, the 12 might have been part of the 70. But they were told that their names were written in heaven. Judas had seen and touched the very, very miracle of God, the Messiah, the Christ. And everybody had been waiting for this conjecture about what Judas was looking for. Some say that they thought that Jesus was going to be some great general. Jesus in the Old Testament and Joshua the name of the Old Testament, the same name, and Joshua was a great general, a great commander of an army of the Israelites. And they went through the land and defeated the enemy then. It's conjectured that maybe Jesus was going to be the, the new jo Joshua of, the, of, the, of that era. He was going to rid uh, the Romans out of Jerusalem and free up the people at the time. 
Um, so there is a thought that maybe that's what he was motivated by. And then when realising that Jesus was not going to be like that, he betrays him at, at this particular place. And Peter, uh, so keen to see Jesus and loved him, no doubt, but was limited in, in having him inside of his life and in the way that we have today. And so there was great moments and there was a not so good moments in, in these stories that we had. And Judas paid the ultimate price. Ultimately, he, he lost his salvation totally. But he had it all. He saw the Messiah. He sat with him. He lived with him. He followed him around for three and a half years. He saw miracles upon miracles. And John writes of the mir all the miracles that were done, if they were written, the world itself would not be able to contain the books therein. And Judas was one of them to see and to experience and to touch the very kingdom of God at its best. And what did he do? He got his own interests involved. He got, he got um, confused. He got distracted. And he lost his life. And Peter was told by Jesus, Satan is desiring you, Peter. But I pray to stay strong in your faith. And when you convert, it, strengthen the brethren. And then we go to verse 60. And Peter said, Man, I know not what thou sayest. Third time. And immediately while he had spoke, the cock crew. And then the Lord turned and looked upon Peter. Can you imagine that moment when Jesus just goes, turns right through the crowd, piercing through the crowd, and you're on the other side of the room or the courthouse in amongst it all and Jesus looks at you and says I said you would deny me three times and boom he's looking at you and me the moment how we would feel and what does it say that is how we would feel and Peter went out so verse 61 also the Lord turned and looked upon Peter and Peter remembered the word of the Lord how he said unto him before the cock crow, thou shalt deny me three times. And Peter went out and wept bitterly. Why was he bitter? He was bitter with his own limited understanding, his own weakness, his own denial. In the face of all the miracles that had been placed, he, he saw the best of Jesus Christ, the Messiah. Jesus did nothing wrong ever by Peter. And in his moment of truth, he denied him. And Peter was just a very sorrowful man on that day. Let's go to John in chapter 21. A good ending, though. I think we've all done that. I've had some great moments when I lived in London. I was just thinking about Stuart then and going back and the opening prayer and how much you've grown in, in your walk in the Lord. But there were times in London, oh, it's just be so weak. Oh, what are you doing, in this, what are you doing from Australia in London? Oh, I'm working. Some days I would, I could have said every single time, well, I'm actually over here to preach the gospel and help set up a fellowship here in North London. And there were times when I would. There were times when I would preach in front of a whole train load of people. Just, yeah. Other days, uh, what are you doing here, Can uh, uh, um, I'm here working. What did you do on the weekend? Oh, I went to London. We just took the family around. There were times of my weakness, just, um, I'm, Confessing my fault. <laughs> I hope I'm not the only one here. So we do have that, those sort of swings, but praise the Lord, we've got to have one of the mercy of God. John in chapter 21, here's a, a great little thought that we have that Jesus has, has died and he's appeared to Thomas in the previous chapter and to the disciples. He's risen from the dead and people have seen it. Uh, but for some reason in verse 21, chapter 21, verse 1, after these things, Jesus showed himself again to the disciples of Sea Tiberias, and on this wise showed he himself. Uh, there were together Simon Peter, Thomas called Didymus, and Nathan of Canaan, Nathaniel of Canaan, and Galilee, and the sons of Zebedee, and the two other disciples. Simon Peter saith unto them, I go a fishing. They say unto him, we go also with thee. And they went forth and entered into a ship immediately, and that night they caught nothing. But when the morning was now come, Jesus stood on the shore, 
Uh, but the disciples knew not that it was Jesus. And Jesus said unto them, Children, have you any meat? And they answered him, No. And he said unto them, Cast the net on the right side of the ship, and you shall find. And they cast their Therefore, and now when they were able to draw, they were not able to draw, for it was mul- for the multitude of fish. Sorry, I'm speaking too fast. <sighs> this is my Aussiness. I'll read again. Verse 6. And he said unto them, Cast the net on the right side of the ship, and ye shall find. They cast therefore. And now they were not able to draw it for the multitude of fish. Therefore, that disciple whom Jesus loved said unto Peter, It is the Lord. Now when Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he girt his fish's coat unto him, for he was naked, and did cast himself into the sea. A couple of things out of the story. The, ver- the chapters before, Jesus has got Thomas in a really, really good place. We're talking about salvation. We're talking about how we, can, we must hang on to it and keep it. And, and we know the Messiah, the Anointed One. We've been filled with the Holy Ghost and fire ourselves. But these are principles that Jesus was teaching. So chapter 20, Thomas doesn't believe that Jesus is alive, except I put my fingers into, you know, my fingers into, his, into the nail prints, etc. And... Jesus appears to Thomas, and then Thomas just says, my Lord, my God. At that moment of, of just repentance and sorrow that he, he didn't believe that his Lord was alive. And great joy as well. But this chapter, Thomas is one of them. Off goes Thomas with Peter. The sons of Zebedee, we know that James was killed with a sword in the book of Acts. John would go on with a full life, the book of Revelation. And we've got other men there that Peter was taken away. And Jesus had said to Peter, when you're converted, strengthen the brethren. And so there's the first point. He's distracted his, these people away from what Jesus was trying to do. And we as leaders and we as brothers and sisters in the Lord, we must always make sure that whatever we do, that we don't distract away by taking another brother or sister away from what Jesus Christ may have planned for them. This Thomas young man had got past his doubts. He was now in a good place. He was calling him my Lord, my God. And Peter was taking that man who he didn't know, was not the shepherd of his soul at that time, and takes him away, distracts him away from what Jesus Christ had planned for him. And John and James, if they'd followed, we wouldn't be reading about those lives of those men. So there's the first one. Then, when Peter sees Jesus, recognises him, in and off the boat he goes, he leaves the seven men that he had taken away from where Jesus was taken them, and he distracts them out in some ocean, back to some old way of life, and leaves them there when he recognises that Jesus is the Lord on the foreshore there. So you've got the two things, bad enough that he takes them away from where the Lord had them in a good place. Worse, he leaves them kind of out in the world, out in the old way of life. And I think this is why Jesus says here, he denies the Lord three times. He's got this situation which is not good. And then Jesus says, verse 20, so when they had died, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Picks the perfect time. They've already eaten. He's waiting for his moment. This is now the time that we would remember this chapter for a long, long time. We read it many times and we refer to it. Simon Peter, son of Jonas, loves them more than these, whatever these were, these men, these things that you're doing, whatever what these were, he saith unto him, Yea, Lord, thou knowest that I love thee. He said, Feed my lambs. Verse 16, he said unto him again, second time, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me? He said unto him, Yea, Lord, thou knowest that I love thee. He said, Feed my sheep. He said unto him a third time, 
Maybe it was to do with the third times of denial, three, three times. Maybe the Lord was correcting his mind and his memory, replanting something positive. You've denied me three times here, but now I'm going to put something back in you that you're going to commit for three times. I'm going to ask you. Because you've distracted these men that I had a plan for, and you've taken them basically out into the world again and left them for dead when you recognised me as the, as the Christ. You thought I'd be happy with that. You come off the boat, you don't help them bring in the, sh the fish that I've caught for you, you leave them all alone, isolated, you don't help them in the labour of the work that they've got, the fish that I've provided for them, and you want to hug me, and you want to sit with me, and you want to talk with me. And Jesus is saying, feed my people. The third time, this time Peter was grieved because he said unto him the third time, lovest thou me? And he said, Lord, thou knowest all things, thou knowest that I love thee. Jesus said unto, them, unto him, feed my sheep. Verse 18, verily, verily, I say unto you, when thou wast young, thou girdest thyself, and did whatever you want, dressed yourself, walk us whither you would go. But when thou shalt be old, thou shalt stretch forth thy hands, and another shall gird thee and carry thee whither thou wouldest not. This spoke he, signifying by what death he should glorify God. And he said unto him, and when he had spoken this, he said unto him, follow me. So we teach, we feed, we teach, we don't distract, we don't think we know we're a brother or sister. Sometimes we have here in Adelaide, we've had people who recently wanting to go to concerts, and then you can argue that one till the cows come home. But if I take a brother or a sister to a concert where there's alcohol, where there's drugs, where there's possible immorality, in a way, I'm doing exactly what Peter did when he took those people on that boat trip away from where Jesus Christ. Hey, I don't know where that person's got. I don't know whether that person has a stumbling block with alcohol, with music, with drugs, but I'm taking that person away from what God might have planned for that individual. And Peter, the Lord being struck, instructed very clearly, feed my sheep. Look after them. Look after them. Don't do anything that will distract away from what I can do in their lives and how I can bless their lives. Just as well, the Lord fixed it up. Because we have James, who went on to live a short life, but a full life. And we have John, but to name a few, where we know about their lives through the book of Revelation. Imagine if we read, and that was the end of their life. They went on fishing, because Peter had a bad moment and a bad day. So I think Jesus got this story for us to say, feed my lambs. And when you were young, you did certain things. When you're old, he gave them an indication that he was going to live a long life. Let's go to 2 Peter, just to finish on. 2 Peter in chapter 2. Just to give you another idea of what the Lord was doing in Peter's life. So he says here, 2 Peter in chapter 2. 2 Peter chapter 1, I beg your pardon, chapter 1. 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 10. Wherefore, the rather, brethren... Give diligence to make your calling and election sure. If you do these things, you shall fail not. As previous verses explained that. To sow an entrance shall minister unto the, you abundantly into the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ. This amazing saviour, salvation that we have. Wherefore, I would not, will not you be negligent to put... <laughs> Sorry, I did it again. So, verse 12. Wherefore, I will not be negligent to put you always in remembrance of these things, though you know them and be established in the present truth. He's writing to the people there. Yeah, I think it meet as long as I'm in this tabernacle to stir you up by putting you in remembrance. And knowing this, have a look, have a look at this verse here. This is direct reference to the Gospel of John that we read. Knowing this, that I must, that shortly I must put off this my tabernacle in my life, even as the Lord Jesus hath showed me. If you look in the reference there, it's talking about chapter 20 at 1, we read where Jesus told him how he was going to die. 
So for the entire life of Peter the Apostle, he knew that he was going to die probably a horrible, horrible way. But all through that, Jesus said, I'm going to build my church on you, Peter. You're going to be a main influence. You're going to be a, a rock. I'm going to build the church on you, Peter, and what you do. Don't neglect my people. Feed them, feed them, feed them. Don't do anything that will take them away from the kingdom of God. And your whole life, Peter had his whole entire life knowing that he's going to have a difficult life. I've got Mr. Humphreys coming into the office right now. And I want to say thank you very much. God bless and thank you for listening to me. And all the people said, Amen. Thanks, Pastor David.